Warning, this is a true crime podcast and is not suitable for all audiences. Please use discretion. It's being described by police as one of the most violent murders in a generation. 14-year-old schoolgirl killed in broad daylight. Jodie Jones had everything to live for, but her life was cut cruelly short. A brutal and bloody murder. She was virtually decapitated. The suspicion fell quickly on just one. Luke Mitchell. On the 30th of June 2003, 14-year-old Jodie Jones was murdered in a village in Scotland near Dalkeith. The prime suspect was her boyfriend, 14-year-old Luke Mitchell. Luke was tried and convicted of Jodie's murder and to this day serves his sentence in a Scottish prison. So why would someone make a six-part podcast series on this case? It's done, right? Jodie has been laid to rest. Her murderer has been taken care of by the justice system and he is serving a long and lengthy sentence. Well, there are petitions. There are protests. There are Facebook groups. There are experts working pro bono. And they all believe the same thing that Luke Mitchell is innocent. The aim of this podcast is not to convince you that Luke is innocent. I don't know for sure that he is. But I'm here to tell you the facts and the investigation that resulted in Luke's conviction. Because quite frankly, it's mind blowing and unlike anything else I've ever heard. I'm Naomi Channel and this is a six part podcast series called Through the Wall, The Case Against Luke Mitchell. I've written so many different introductions to this podcast and none of them are articulating exactly what I want to say. First, I should introduce myself. I'm Naomi, I'm a TV producer and I have been for 16 years. A big part of my job involves intensive research into subjects, cases and people. I live just outside of London in the UK and I have a family. I'm a mother and a wife. I have a podcast series that appeals for information for missing and murdered people, which I produce with the cooperation and consent from the victims' families. So to do this podcast feels strange and completely at odds with what I have been doing. But there is so much online about this case, so many different opinions. I felt that a podcast would be a good way of laying out the facts, not opinions, just facts. The most important thing here is that Jodie Jones is respected and justice for her murder is served. Some people believe that justice is being served. Luke has been in prison for a very long time. But a lot of people think that it's not being served and there is a chance that it's not. Here you're going to learn all about the investigation into Luke Mitchell, how it started, how it progressed and how it ended. For that, We need to start at the beginning and go back to June 2003. Jodie Jones was a beautiful girl. Not in a traditional sense, she had an edge. Her photos are online, you can search them, and you'll see she was part of an alternative scene. Some might describe her as gothic, an emo, grungy. Many teenagers fitted that description in 2003 and still do to this day. And alongside that you will see a beautiful face, a tall girl with a slender figure and shiny hair. And her smile, it's just lovely. Looking at her makes me wonder what she would have been when she reached adulthood. But her life was cut short in the most awful way. I first came across Jodie's name on Twitter and I saw it alongside the name Luke Mitchell and then I saw it again and again and again. I saw people who had added 
Justice for Luke Mitchell actually within their Twitter usernames. I saw trending hashtags and I saw retweets of news articles. A few true crime bloggers I follow were retweeting a link to a petition, a petition calling for justice for Luke Mitchell. I had assumed Luke was the murder victim here. But the more I read, the more I realised that he was in fact a convicted killer. And he has been convicted for murdering Jodie. And then I saw a company in hashtags in these tweets. Hashtag Luke Mitchell. Hashtag Adnan Saeed. Hashtag Richard Rosario. Hashtag Yervon Tillman. Hashtag Lamont Madison. Hashtag Kevin Strickland. The hashtags go on and on. And these hashtags were all names of people, mostly men, who have been wrongly convicted of murder. So there were people out there who clearly thought that Luke Mitchell was innocent. But why? What was it about his case that was different from the cases of thousands of other murderers convicted of the worst crime imaginable? Well, the answer to that is not simple. But it is interesting. It's thought-provoking and it's not impossible. As I said in the beginning, this podcast has not been made to convince you that Luke Mitchell is innocent. It's been made to explore a case that is trending online responsibly by providing the facts. I need to note here that Luke's case has been in the media before, multiple times in fact, in newspapers, magazines, on radio and television. In 2021, a UK TV station called Channel 5 released a two-part documentary series on the case against Luke. It was called Murder in a Small Town. I've seen it. It was thought-provoking. As a TV producer myself, one thing did stand out. It was strongly in Luke's favour. I won't spoil it in case you'd like to watch it for yourselves. But I will say that there were several legal professionals who featured on the documentary that clearly say they do not believe Luke should be in prison. There was also a programme called Frontline Scotland and they covered Luke's case in 2007. His episode was titled Luke Mitchell, The Devil's Own. That title ended with a question mark. Investigative journalist Samantha Polin fronted the show and also seemed to suggest that Luke could be innocent. This show was on the BBC, so this was a strong move, especially in 2007, to feature a case that was so brutal about the murder of a child, allegedly by another child, and to suggest that that convicted killer was innocent. A lot of TV producers I know would be wary of producing a documentary that seemed to show bias. But... Was it bias? Or was it just fact? Over the last 10 years, we've seen a big rise in true crime documentaries and podcasts, especially in cases where there is a belief that there has been a miscarriage of justice. Kim Kardashian, who undoubtedly is one of the most famous women in the world, recently passed the bar and she's publicly spoken about her work to help free the wrongfully convicted. She has a podcast, a TV show and a huge social media following. And the biggest global streaming platforms are also making documentaries that focus on stories of people who might be wrongfully convicted. For example, there's a series on Netflix called Making a Murderer. You might have heard of it or you might have seen it. It's about a man called Stephen Avery, a man who was wrongly convicted of rape and served two decades in prison for the crime before the real suspect was caught. The documentary shows him coming out of prison, only then to be arrested for the murder of another woman. A large number of people believe that Stephen and his nephew, Brendan Dassey, who was convicted alongside him, have been wrongly convicted. And Serial was a podcast presented by Sarah Koenig. She's an American journalist and she covered the case against Adnan Saeed. He was a 17-year-old Muslim boy from Baltimore and he was convicted of killing his girlfriend, Haymin Lee. He served 23 years in prison for the 1999 murder 
And in 2014, the podcast flung Adnan's case into the global spotlight. The podcast received millions of downloads and many people were convinced that Adnan was innocent based on facts relayed by Sarah in the podcast. She's never shown bias. She admitted when things didn't add up in Adnan's favour, but she shone a light on a lot of the facts that did. And that's what I'm aiming to do here. Oh, and Adnan, well, he was freed from prison and his conviction was overturned in October 2022. Before we get into this case, I had something I wanted to ask you as an audience. Do you trust the justice system? If, God forbid, you had a loved one who was murdered, would you trust the police to put the right person in the dock? It's a loaded question, I get it. Well, I went out and asked some people what they thought. I wanted some other opinions aside from my own. Here's what they said. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't think I personally trust them. I know there's a lot of injustices that I've seen very locally to me that haven't been resolved, and there's been a lot of mishandling of evidence by the police. No, or at least not entirely, because all people have an inherent level of bias within them. So it's only inevitable that that's going to be replicated in the structures that people build. Um, I think that it's important to have a justice system, but equally as important that, you know, we stay vigilant to the ways that maybe it doesn't always function perfectly. My answer would probably be yes, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to murder, there is a lot more resourcing. I think it's the one crime within the police where there are huge teams working on an investigation around the clock. So... Yes, I think when it comes to murder, I believe that they would find the right person and bring justice for the victim and their families. You'd hope so, but you don't know. I mean, it's, the police can get it wrong. Um, well, that's pretty big, isn't it? I don't know how to answer this question. Shit. Um, I like to think I would anyway, because if you can't trust, if, if, if I couldn't, if I couldn't, if I didn't feel that, if I didn't feel like I did trust them, then that would be a pretty bleak place to be in. And I think I probably would, actually, yeah, for something like murder. Generally, I'd say probably not. Because I suspect that there's a lot of disadvantaged people who probably don't have the same kind of access that I think some more privileged people would. I think I do trust the justice system because I feel that we, we have to trust the justice system because if we can't trust the justice system, what else do we have? Uh, that doesn't mean to say I don't have really big doubts about it because I've seen it in action and I've seen where it goes wrong. But I feel that it's perhaps more comforting to trust it because it's what we've got. So it's worth keeping that question in mind. Do you trust the justice system? Let's get back to the case and let's go back to June 2003. Jodie Jones was born in 1989, so in 2003 she was 14 years old. She was born into a working class family in East Houses, Scotland. She was the youngest of three children and was described as a child who loved art, especially painting and poetry. But her life was far from easy growing up. Her father committed suicide in 1998 when Jodie was just nine years old. Jodie was particularly close to her older sister Janine. People who knew Jodie explained that like pretty much every teenager I've ever met, she rebelled a little. She experimented with marijuana, she dyed her hair and she listened to alternative music. 
She started dating local boy Luke Mitchell in February 2003. They knew each other through school and they got serious quickly. This developed into a sexual relationship and Jodie wrote about him in her diary. In one entry from spring 2003, Jodie wrote the following. I think I'm actually in love with Luke. Not in a stupid way. I mean real love. God, I think I would die if he finished with me. If I'm crying, he hugs me and strokes my face. He is just so sweet. No matter what he says, I believe him. A little bit about Luke. He was also 14 and he was the youngest of two children. He lived with his mother Corinne and his brother Shane. Luke's mother and father had had an amicable divorce when Luke was 11 years old. They had a financially stable household and Luke liked music, riding horses and he had an interest in motorbikes. He was described as a good pupil. One of his teachers had expressed concerns about an essay he'd written where he detailed violence. You won't hear many personal opinions from me through this podcast. My opinion doesn't matter. But I will say that I teach one day a week at a college and my students range from 16 plus. And some of the work they've submitted has been violent, graphic and sometimes disturbing. But it's worth reminding ourselves here that teenage boys and girls are often exposed to violence through films and video games in their teenage years. A lot of the time, I've discovered, it's general teenage angst and their work is a way of expressing themselves. Sometimes, though less frequently, it is an indication that something isn't right. So let's keep that in mind for now. On the night in question, the 30th of June, Jodie told her family that she was going to meet Luke. She had been grounded that week, but her mother had ended her punishment and so now she was allowed to go out. She told her mother that she was going to go and hang out with Luke locally in two villages called Mayfield and East Houses. She had texted Luke at 4.34pm and again at 4.38pm. She had sent these texts from her mother's phone. Her phone was broken. In the first message Jodie sent to Luke, she asked him if he wanted to meet up. He replied that he'd be out later, after dinner, and he suggested that Jodie come down to where he lived. She messaged him back saying she would see him later. He was usually tasked with cooking dinner for his family every weekday, except Tuesdays, which was his mum's day off. Jodie left her house around 5pm. We'll go into a detailed timeline in a future episode, as there are a lot of factors that are conflicting when it comes to the precise timings of this evening. Luke called Jodie's landline phone at 5.32pm and again at 5.40pm. The first time the call didn't connect, so he tried again and he got hold of Jodie's mother's partner, Alan Ovens. He told Luke that Jodie had either left or just left, he couldn't remember. By 7pm, Jodie still hadn't arrived to meet Luke so he called his mother. He told his mother to direct Jodie to the grounds of a nearby historical spot called New Battle Abbey, where Luke had arranged to meet some other friends. When Jodie failed to return home, her mother Judith texts Luke's phone with a message for Jodie. Remember, Jodie's phone was broken. And that text message read, Right Toad, two weeks grounding, say bye to Luke. Luke called Judith when he received that message. He told her he hadn't seen Jodie all evening. Judith called Luke back seven minutes later at 10.49pm and she said that nobody could find Jodie and that she was calling the police. She was in tears. Luke told her he would go back outside to look for her so he took a torch and his dog Mia who was on a lead. She called him back again 10 minutes later at 10.59pm and he told her that he was at the new battle entrance of a path called the Rones Dyke Path. Remember the name of this path, it's significant to this case. It joins the two villages that Luke and Jodie lived in. 
On a map, it looks remote, maybe not somewhere you would want to walk down alone at night, though many locals use the path frequently. Some of Jodie's family also started searching for her. Jodie's grandmother, Alice, Jodie's sister, Janine, who lived with her grandmother, and Janine's boyfriend, Stephen Kelly, went out together to look for her. They saw Luke on Rowan's Dyke path, and they started walking down the path to try and find her in the direction that Luke had just come from. Luke joined them. Jodie's grandmother Alice suggested they walk back in that direction in case Luke had missed anything. Luke asked if anyone had anything of Jodie's with them. His dog Mia had been trained as a tracker dog. Luke instructed Mia to seek Jodie. Jodie's hiding. Find Jodie. This put her in working mode. Shortly after they started walking, they came across a V-shaped parting in the wall that ran between the path and a wooded area. I've seen a picture of this hole in the wall and it looks like the wall has cracked and worn away. It stops about four feet off the ground. What was on the other side of that wall would change their lives forever. As they walked past the V-shaped parting in the wall, Mia, the dog, stood on her back legs and started sniffing the air. This was a sign that she might be onto something, so Luke doubled back to the V-shaped parting. He had a torch with him, which he shone over the wall, but he said he couldn't see anything. So to get a better look, he jumped over the wall, handing Mia's lead to Jodie's grandmother, Alice. Luke's voice broke the silence. He said, I think there's something here. Stephen Kelly, Jodie's sister's boyfriend, jumped over the wall to join Luke. He returned moments later, looking distressed. Jodie's grandmother Alice got the boys to help her over the wall, leaving Jodie's sister Janine to hold the dog's lead. Alice wanted to see for herself. And what she saw made her scream. And that made Janine scream too. Luke called the police from his phone. The time was 11.35pm. He told the police that they had found something and asked the police to join them straight away. Three minutes later, the police called him back for directions so they could locate him. Just moments later, Stephen Kelly also called 999 from Janine's phone. It's a body. Tell them it's a fucking body. The transcript of this call isn't easy to read. The operator is extremely annoyed about Stephen swearing. Considering the nature of the call, you'd think this would be the last thing they'd be concerned about. At 11.55pm, a police officer who had arrived on the scene radioed to his colleagues that a body had been found. I need to note something of huge significance here. At this point, the police were acting under three false pieces of information. Number one, that Luke was the only person out searching for Jodie. Number two, that he was on his bike. Number three, that he'd been out with Jodie that evening. These things might not seem hugely important now, But as the rest of the story unfolds, you'll see why this is significant. Initially, the police took three members of the search party to a car park at the back of a local school called New Battle High School. Luke was left behind with an officer who asked him to show him where Jodie was. But Luke refused to go back so the police officer went over the wall on his own to try to locate Jodie. Luke was stood on the path, alone, with just his dog. The police radioed there was a body. Luke was taken to the local school car park along with everyone else, where police gathered along with other members of Jodie's family. Luke and Stephen Kelly, Jodie's sister's boyfriend, sat down together on a curbside. 
they were smoking. It was at this time that Luke was approached by a police officer who asked him to get in the back of a waiting police car with his dog. So while Stephen, Jodie's sister Janine and her grandmother Alice were reunited with other family members, Luke was driven off, alone, to Dalkeith Station. But Jodie's mother hadn't been the only person looking for their child that night. Corinne, Luke's mother, was frantically trying to reach him. Luke noticed his phone was ringing in the back of the police car and as he went to answer it, a police officer took it from him and switched it off. Five minutes later, the police officer instructed Luke to call his mother's number. The police officer then spoke to Corinne and told her to meet them at the police station. On the way to the police station, they passed Corinne, who was running frantically up the road. They stop alongside her, the engine of the car is running, and her 14-year-old son is in the back with his dog. She struggles to hear what the officer is saying, but she hears two words. Jodie's dead. She's not allowed in the car. They say she can't come in because of potential contamination issues and they leave her to run the rest of the way to the station. Luke is taken into the station, he is stripped, and he is made to wear a forensic suit made of paper. His clothes have been taken by police. And back in the car park of New Battle High School, Jodie's family and friends gathered. They have just been told their beloved daughter, sister, grandchild was dead but that was just the start of the unimaginable information they were about to receive. I'm going to read a list of the injuries Jodie sustained. It's very hard to listen to, so I'm placing a warning here. Skip the next 60 seconds if you don't want to listen to them. I debated listing these in the podcast, but I realised this is part of Jodie's story. We shouldn't play down the facts, We shouldn't play down how she was taken from the world. And I promised to provide facts, so here they are. This is a summary of Jodie's injuries. We'll cover these in more detail alongside forensic evidence in a later episode. But for now, know this. Jodie was bound. Her arms were tied behind her back with her own trousers. She had been beaten. Her hair had been pulled out by the roots. She had been strangled. Her throat had been slashed at least 12 times, almost decapitating her, piercing her tonsils. She had wounds on her torso, her ears, her cheek and her eyelids. She had been murdered and she was a child. Reading what was done to Jodie was awful, and saying it out loud feels barbaric. Imagine that was your daughter, or someone you knew and loved. And Jodie was loved, that's been very clear. So who hated her enough to do this to her? To put her through that? She did nothing wrong, and her and her family did not deserve what happened to her. Next time, we'll hear what happened next. We'll find out why Luke was the only person to be taken away from the crime scene and to the police station. What did the police know that everyone else didn't? This podcast has been produced by me, Naomi Channel. Episode 2 is out now. See you there.